On this week in Enterprise Tech, we have a fantastic panel. We have Mr. Curtis Franklin and Mr. Brian Chi on the show today. Now, here in the show, we've talked about a lot of breaches over the years, but we were always calling out that your weakest link is your users. But today, we're going to go through a specific group of your users that might be your greatest security vulnerability. Plus, your organization probably has a fire hose of data and tons of data storage. Managing an organization, your data can be very difficult. Well, today, we have Katie Horvath. She's Chief Marketing Officer at Analytics. To talk about insights as a service, AI, and data management. Lots to talk about. You definitely shouldn't miss it. Twyat on the set. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Twyat. This Week in Enterprise Tech, episode 481, recorded February 18th, 2022. Risky Business Analytics. This episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by CDW. From cybersecurity to multi-cloud strategy, CDW gets you need a trusted partner to help drive success. Learn more at cdw.com slash services. And by Progress. Progress has the technology you need to secure, analyze, and integrate your applications, network, and processes. Find out more and download a free trial at progress.com slash twit. And by Bitwarden. Get the password manager that offers a robust and cost-effective solution that can drastically increase your chances of staying safe online. Get started with a free trial of a Teams or Enterprise plan or get started for free across all devices as an individual user at bitwarden.com slash twit. Welcome to Twyat This Week in Enterprise Tech, the show that is dedicated to you, the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and that geek who just wants to know how this world is connected. I'm your host, Louis Moresca, your guide through the big world of the enterprise. But I can't guide you by myself. I need to bring in the professionals, the experts in their field, starting with our very own Mr. Brian G. He's net architect at Sky Fiber and all around tech geek. He's always got the toys. G Bert, how are you doing this week? And uh, what toys are you playing with this week? I'm doing great. And right now I am learning how to manage and adjust my Tesla power wall. Ooh, um, yeah. The goal is to be, draw nothing from the grid, if at all possible, and balance that between having battery backup in case there's outages. Ought to be fun. Yeah, yeah. Very cool. I wish I had that today. I, I had to run on generator for a while. So uh, maybe I'll look into that as well. Well, speaking of experts and an all-around interesting guy as well, he is a senior analyst at Omdia, and he's our very own Mr. Curtis Franklin. Curtis, how are you this week? Uh, what's been keeping you busy? Oh, all kinds of things keeping me busy, Lou. Uh, one of them is that since I don't have the high-tech toys that uh, <laughs> our friend Brian does, I'm uh, getting ready to rebuild a carburetor on a generator, you know, down here in Florida, we use generators primarily as a tool for warding off hurricanes. You know, it's the <laughs> same principle that says you carry an umbrella so that it never starts raining. Uh, you have a generator so that the hurricanes don't come. So far, uh, mine has successfully warded off hurricanes for nearly 15 years. But since I don't run it all the time, I do have to occasionally go in and rebuild parts of the system. So that's on my horizon. Uh, aside from that, looking forward to talking to a lot of different companies about things like enterprise cybersecurity awareness training. It's my big project. And believe it or not, already starting to get ready for a couple of big security conferences coming up, RSA in San Francisco in June and Black Hat in Las Vegas in early August. It's amazing how the time does fly. Well, thank you, Curtis, for being here. It has been quite a busy week in the enterprise, so let's get started. Now, here on the show, we've talked about a ton of data breaches over the years. Now, we always talk about how your weakest link is your users, but today we're going through a specific group of your users and how they might be your greatest security vulnerability. See what, if you can guess which group of users that is before we get to the segment. Plus, your organization probably has a fire hose of data and tons of data to store. Now, managing that data can be very difficult. Well, today we have Katie Horvath. She's Chief Marketing Officer at Analytics to talk about insights and insights as a service, AI, and data management. So stick around. We have lots to talk about here on Twyat. But before we do, we do have to jump in this week's news blips. 
Now, if you're using Linux, you know, it does a pretty good job of being secured out of the box. Now, as with anything, there are always ways to harden the security from its default settings. Well, that is becoming even more and more prominent on Linux. There has been a wave of new vulnerabilities targeted at default installations. Now, the vulnerabilities have been disclosed in Canonical's Snap software packaging and deployment system. The worst of the exploits is the one that can escalate privileges to gain root privileges. Now, Snaps are self-contained application packages that are designed to work on operating systems that use the Linux kernel and can be installed using a tool called Snapped. Now, if you use Linux, you're probably familiar with this tool. Now, tracked as CVE 2021 44 4731. The issue concerns a privilege escalation flaw in the snap confined function, a program used to internally by snapped to construct the execution environment for snap applications. Now the shortcoming is related to is actually rated at 7.8 on the CVSS scoring system. It's pretty high. That's because there's successful exploitation of this vulnerability and it allows any unprivileged user to gain root privileges on the vulnerable host. In fact, it can help users obtain full root privileges on default installations of Ubuntu. Now, the question is, how is Red Hat responding here? Well, Red Hat is an independent uh, in an independent advisory described the issue as a race condition in the snap confined component and the vulnerability was reported to Ubuntu security team on October 27th on 2021 following which patches were released on February 17th so pretty long after that as part of their coordinated disclosure process now, the good thing here is it's not remote remote exploitable that means that you aren't going to have random hackers scanning the internet finding the machine and gaining root access unless they find another way onto the machine as a user. Now, what it does mean is that there are other root expo ex execution exploitations out there, and this one could make it worse for you because they gain root access. Now, what you should do right away is go out and patch your system immediately. And if you're, if not only that, you should also find out the other six threats that they've called out currently that have similar characteristics. A lot of people don't realize that the NSA has two stated functions for the organizations. Now, one is the super dark spy stuff that they're famous for, but the other is to guide and advise both government agencies and U.S. commercial interests on best cybersecurity practices. It's in that second role that the NSA this week issued fresh guidance for organizations on selecting strong passwords for Cisco devices. And in doing so, they cited an increase in the number of compromises involving poorly protected network infrastructure. The NSA didn't offer an explanation for the timing of the guidance, so it's not immediately clear whether its password recommendations were prompted by heightened concerns in the U.S. over Russian cyber attacks or just by more generalized fears of poorly protected Cisco devices on critical federal agency networks and elsewhere. Just this week, for instance, the U.S. Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, or CISA, warned about Russia-backed threat actors stealing sensitive data from private organizations and contractors in the U.S. defense industrial base. The CISA warning followed an advisory from the agency a couple of days before, urging U.S. organizations to assume a shields-up stance in preparation for potential Russian cyber attacks. Now, the NSA's latest guidance notes the different hashing and encryption algorithms available to administrators for protecting passwords stored inside Cisco router configurations. When organizations use weak passwords and insecure, easily reversible hashes, attackers can and have been able to retrieve passwords from device configuration files and use them to compromise the device and the entire network, according to the NSA. Guidance notes the numbering system that Cisco uses to indicate the different algorithm types that the vendor makes available to organizations for securing passwords and device configuration files. According to the NSA, organizations should not use any algorithm other than type 8 for securing passwords and type 6 for protecting VPN keys. Guidance specifically warns organizations not to use type 0, 4, and 7 algorithms, describing them as being easy to crack. The other two algorithms, types 5 and 9, haven't been approved yet for use by NIST. So this story actually comes from near and dear to my heart. I, I actually worked in the high-energy physics group at the University of Hawaii, and the promise of 
clean power from fusion has, well, it's been around quite a while. So this is a great story and it really illustrates how so many great achievements are built upon years and years of trial and error. The story talks about how the big issue is learning how to precisely control the magnets that shape the so-called magnetic bottle to maintain shape of the plasma to avoid collapse of the containment and potentially scorching the containment walls. Well, what AIs are good at is learning very, very quickly. And the iterative process of learning how to maintain containment is exactly how you train an AI. Well, what the folks at the Swiss Plasma Center in Lucerne uh, is doing is to train its AI on a simulator of their tokamak fusion reactor. Well, the key task here is to create enough detailed simulations to evaluate a huge range of potential control options. So as an AI waits to take a hot fusion tokamak out for a spin, what we have now is a race to see if proton boron or hot fusion reaches break even first. Either way, the promise of fusion energy could very well save the world from its insatiable thirst for petroleum-based energy production. Now, over the past several years, there's been an uptick in the number of state-driven cyber attacks, and a lot of them are actually stemming from Russia. Now, part of it is because the criminal underground there has constantly been evolving and shifting. Now, more recently, ransomware campaigns have been the attack method of choice among Russian-speaking cybercrime rings. The reason is quite simple. Ransomware and data theft extortion operations are successful across every industry vertical, every one of them. Uh, now, in the past, the best financial uh, opportunities for cyber criminals were found in point of sale systems, which limited the target to those industries that rely on credit card transactions. Now, ransomware broadens the horizon so it can be used in education, healthcare, manufacturing, and many other parts of the industry. Now, the interesting part about these state based cyber criminals is that their ecosystem and environment has been stable compared to other factions across the world. Now, Russian speaking cybercrime groups established early in the 21st century continue to thrive using the same popular forums and sites continuously. Now, last year saw some uncharacteristic friction between cybercrime organizations and the Russian language scheme or scene, much which uh, can be attributed to increased law enforcement activity, particularly between Russian and U.S. officials. Now, the, that cracks become apparent when looking at the Colonial Pipeline attacks, which was conducted by a ransomware group, Darkside, believed to be created by former associates of the rebel group. Now, Russia has long been perceived as a relative safe haven for cyber criminals to operate in, as long as they don't target the Russian entities. The FSB, the Federal Security Service, activity challenges this notion. Now, it's, it is realistically possible that the prolific ransomware groups uh, may feel compelled to scale back their activities to avoid the, the FSB. Now, with the changes in ransomware partner programs, a new Russian language cybercrime and cybercriminal ransomware form was created. It's called the Ransom Anon Marketplace, known as RAMP. Um, now, its, its role was to offer a ransomware as a service to its clients. But after the forum's original creator left, RAMP took on a new life, turning into a gathering space for Chinese criminals to collaborate with Russian speakers. Now, one thing that all cybercrime has, has in common is financial gain. We know this. Now, with the branding of ransomware groups, Russian language crime groups have shifted towards working more cooperatively with their other regions or national sponsors, nation sponsored groups. Now that's where organizations need to become more vigilant. Make sure to start with working through that stepped program to help protect you from ransomware threats and ensure you always have ways to recover and, and get yourself out of trouble. Now, if anything else, if you're prepared, this may be the year you get to be overlooked by those targeted ransomware attacks. Well, folks, that does it for the blips. Next up, the bites. But before we get to the bites, we do have to thank a really great sponsor of this week in Enterprise Tech, and that's CDW Amplified Services. Now, reaching your organizational goals feels complex and daunting. Not only are you responsible for implementing the right technology solutions, but you must also drive outcomes and innovate at scale with speed. And it's crucial that you have a partner you can trust who really understands your business and goals. CDW understands that to stay competitive in a changing landscape, you constantly need to move faster and innovate smarter. CDW Amplified Services will design, orchestrate, and manage technology solutions that help organizations accelerate their goals and drive success. From enhancing customer experiences to bolstering security, CDW will help you quickly execute on digital priorities and amplify your organization's vision for today 
and the future. The experts at CDW will collaborate with you from start to finish based on your organization's unique challenges. They'll develop roadmaps, handle deployment, and manage your environment to ensure the right technology solutions are driving success. Advanced cybersecurity protection and response to mitigate threats to your organization's data and physical entities. Multi-cloud strategy to optimize your data and applications across all your cloud environments, allowing you access from anywhere and the flexibility to scale. App modernization and software development to make the most out of existing applications or to develop custom new ones, increasing agility and streamlining experiences. Data optimization that empowers you to transform your data into actionable insights from machine learning and data visualizations all the way down to storage management and operations. IT support services give you access to 24-7 custom warranty, maintenance, and support services, protecting your investment and freeing your staff's time to focus on the bigger picture. From cybersecurity to multi-cloud strategy, CDW gets you need a trusted partner to help drive success. To reach your technology goals, trust the experts at CDW Amplified Services. People get it. Learn more at cdw.com slash services. That's cdw.com slash services. And we thank CDW Amplified Services for their support of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Well, folks, it's time for the bites. Now, you probably called into a help desk before, right? And you've talked to customer service. Now, your organization might even have a department for that, or maybe they even farm that part of the business out. Now, having worked in the CRM systems and services for many, many years, I can tell you that it definitely has had to evolve over the years to project um, that those that horizontal that they need to have when it comes to information gathering. Now, every organization would like to assume that their help desk employees are trustworthy, right? And in most cases, the staff likely is. No, in, no ill intentions there. However, there have been incidents in which rogue employee has used the organization's data for personal gain, as the case in Trend Micro breach we just heard about a few years ago. Now, given the amount of damage that the rogue support technician could have or conceivably cause, it makes sense to take steps to limit the potential harm here, right? One of the major cybersecurity initiatives over the past several years has been the move towards zero trust security. Now, limiting the help desk staff's exposure to highly sensitive information aligns perfectly with existing zero trust initiatives. Now, implementing such controls, however, can, can be a lot more challenging. After all, how can an organization realistically put limits on its support staff without affecting their ability to do their jobs, right? Well, there can be heavy attrition in the service industry and making it harder for them to do their job can actually eventually impact the customers as well. Now, there are ways to snap or take a stepping stone approach here. A good first step in bringing zero trust to the help desk is to identify the situations that might actually put help desk employees in possession of sensitive or potentially damaging information. Now, once those situations have been identified, an organization can work to find alternate support methods that would make it harder for a rogue help desk user or employee to cause harm. Now, many organizations have implemented self-service password reset capabilities using tools like SecOps, USET, Reset, or something similar. And this is often done primarily at cost cutting, as a cost-cutting measure. Now, a 2020 study by Gartner estimates that password tickets consume 31% to 40, 40% of help desk's time, which can actually add up, right? However, a self-service password reset mechanism can also help to improve the security because it greatly reduces the number of password reset requests that a help desk request an employee actually receives. And that means that the requests that, that do make through the help desk will likely receive a greater scrutiny than, than the ones that don't. Now, the help desk has been a long favorite target for those wishing to use social engineering techniques as well, schemes for gaining access to the organization's data. As such, most organizations have put policies in place that require help desk technicians to do something to validate a caller's identity before actually granting them things like password reset. Now, the authentication process is designed to protect the organization, can also put extremely sensitive information into the hands of rogue help desk technicians as well. What can help? Well, self-service portals can help as well. Um, hardening the password reset workflow can also help. Now, over the past several years, we know there's been an uptick in the number of state-driven cyber attacks uh, from Russia. Now, part of it's because of the cyber criminal underground here. Now, they are also targeting these types of things. Um, I, but I do want to bring my uh, my co-host back in here uh, because the, the key here is 
you know, even if you're vigilant here and you're you're putting walls up and you're putting more uh, policies in place, you know, maybe even focusing on passwords, like I just mentioned, you know, can you can you really protect against bad actor in, in your help desk? What do you think, Curtis? Well, the help desks are interesting because, as the article noted, um, they have permissions to attack on a couple of different bases. One, they often either have or are able to have things like RDP sessions where they can log in. They have extraordinary um, administration passwords in many organizations so that they can you know, fulfill their legitimate job of helping users. In addition, they have the trust, the, the human trust. And, and here, let's, let's be real careful. Trust is one of those words that is used in a bunch of different ways in security. Here, we're talking about human to human trust. Uh, when you call the help desk, you tend to assume that they are going to try to help you. And in general, you're calling at a time when you are under stress. Relatively few of us say, hey, it's a slow Tuesday. I think I'll call up the nice folks on the help desk and just chat a while. You really want to get back operating. So with those two things going on, the level of access and privilege is extraordinarily high. And so I'm going to say there is probably no way to fully protect against a bad actor on the help desk compromising an individual endpoint. Now, what you can do is use principles like least privilege to make sure that if they compromise one machine, their ability to spread laterally and inflict damage across the entire organization is quite limited. Um, zero trust architecture is a piece of that, um, but it really goes far beyond that. You know, you, you're getting into an area where the problem is vast, and so the potential solution set is also pretty darned involved. What do you think, Chibert? Is there any way, I know Curtis brought out some ideas on how we can do this, but you know, some organizations, you know, the entry point is to give their service agents the most information so that they can help their customers. So is there really a way to, to you know, right out the door, protect against a rogue agent? You know, it, I, I think a lot of it depends on the backend technology. A lot of the very sophisticated single sign-on systems um, actually require that the password reset um, person executing the password reset actually has quite a few um, privileges. And so you, the concept of least amount of privilege or least privilege doesn't always work. And this is one of the things that I keep you know, complaining about when I start playing the SSO game. Now, when you start getting into, you know, RDP help desk sessions and so forth, keep in mind, a lot of these are built upon, you know, someone else's system. Um, I happen to use the remote desktop option that goes through the Sonic Wall SSL VPN system, but there's a lot of them that are based on other pieces. And when you start having pieces outside the control of your organization, say a hosted, um, help desk type of system, how much control do you have again? So I, I have a problem with that. Now, so things are changing. We want zero trust as much as possible, even in the help desk. Um, I would love, love, love to see more checks and balances. Um, sadly, a lot, of the, a lot of the organizations I've worked with in the past treat the help desk as the entry point into the corp into the corporate IT world. So you get people that are relatively low paid. Um, help desk a lot of times is considered the doldrums or you know corporate IT hell. And when you start treating your help desk that has a lot of the keys to the kingdom, 
where are the temptations? You know, we might start having way too many temptations. It's again, you know, we've got a person in a position of trust that's not paid very well, typically, and typically also underappreciated within the organization. And so you start going, hmm, are we putting are we putting things in the correct priority? I'd like to see that change. Um, I'd like to see more things change. There's a system that I worked with um, that happens to be the second largest convention center internet service provider in the United States. Because so much was being put onto the password to the routers in the convention centers, we actually made it so that the passwords were single use. Uh, we actually used TACAX. And so we would have to call back to our central office and they'd issue a one time password so that we could get in, make the changes, and then it would actually disable the password out from under the text at the location. So that if they had to log, they get dropped or something, they have to log in again. It's a lot of really interesting solutions. And I don't think there's a good answer quite yet. I think it's going to be one of those um, enterprise IT segments that's going to be changing a lot. And I have a high, high hope for password less and go to, uh, you know, physical dongles or biometrics or something like that. I'd, I'd like to see us get away from passwords because that would, you know, solve a lot of evils. I'm not saying it's a perfect solution, but cross my fingers. Right. Now, so one interesting angle here is there's there's recently a, a new executive order regarding uh, cybersecurity. And, and obviously it's pushing organizations to rethink a lot about their data, a lot about how they're handling, you know, their code, their services, and how they're handling data. Now, Curtis, I want to I want to throw this to you because you know, obviously, a lot of organizations are, are attempting to to move to the zero trust model, and it, it lets them kind of segregate um, different systems and um, different micro segmentation, so they can have data in different spots. Um, you know, how much of this is being driven by something like the executive order or GDPR, and will that maybe affect the services industry? Well, I think, I think we have to look at it in, in two different ways because right now the executive order has not had cases brought, so no one's quite sure what penalties might go with it. Uh, GDPR is different. GDPR has been proven to have teeth. And so I think that right now, with those two, what we have to say is that GDPR is absolutely critical to the thinking of executives when they're thinking about especially the privacy and security of their customer and employee data. No question about that. Where it doesn't really have an impact is on company confidential data, things like uh, trade secrets. Um, and proprietary information, things like that. The executive order is, I would say, one of those things that is being used to encourage compliance with best practices. Uh, there are a lot of CIOs and CISOs who are using that to go to executive boards and say, look, we need to have the money to invest in this because we have the executive order. And this is especially true if it's a company that does any business at all with the federal government. Um, have we seen it have a huge material impact driving spending and behavior? I would say not yet. Um, Give us uh, a couple of months, let us get into the next budget cycle, and we might well see more. I am also waiting to see whether the international uh, scenario that's unfolding uh, in Eastern Europe has uh, an impact on how this executive order is used by private organizations and public organizations to uh, to fund their cybersecurity regimes. I suspect 
that we're going to start seeing a lot of money moving away from things that had been caused by and were concentrated on pandemic behavior towards those that are aimed at keeping data uh, and information secure from international threat actors. I agree. I agree. Well, folks, that does it for the bites. Next up, we get to bring in a guest to drop some knowledge on this. Why, right? Before we get to that, we do have to thank a really great sponsor of this week in enterprise tech, and that is Progress. Now, some of my favorite development tools are Progress Telerik tools. I've used them for tons of years. Fiddlers being one of my favorite tools out there. I can't even name the amount of times that tool saved my life. Progress is a fantastic company. They've been enabling enterprise experiences for decades and have assembled the technologies that will empower businesses to thrive in a post-COVID world. Now, most companies don't have the resources to invest in technology as digital goliaths. They need to use technology to create differentiation with a smaller investment. They can achieve this by turning to Progress as their trusted provider. And with progress, any organization can achieve the level of differentiation that is critical in today's business environment. Now, whether you're an IT professional concerned about networking and infrastructure, security and compliance, or enabling web and digital experiences, progress has a solution for you. Now they have move it, manage file transfer, provides control, security, and visibility over all file transfer activities. Transferring confidential data through insecure channels opens your organization up to liabilities. Now with manage file transfer solution, you gain insight into who has access to your files if the file is accessed and when. Now what's up gold network monitoring allows you to monitor networks, applications, and devices both in the cloud and on premises. Kemp Load Master Load Balancer is a next generation load balancing and application delivery solution for private, public, and hybrid cloud. Flowmon Network Intelligence is a network performance monitoring and network detection and response solution. And Sitefinity Digital Experience Platform build digital experiences across channels that improve business agility and foster personal relationships with visitors. Progress has the technology you need to secure, analyze, and integrate your applications, network, and processes. Find out more and download a free trial at progress.com slash twit. Don't miss out. Visit progress.com slash twit for your very own progress swag bag. And we thank Progress for their support of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Well, folks, it's my favorite part of the show. We actually get to bring in a guest to drop some knowledge on the Twyat Riot. Today, we have Katie Horvath. She's Chief Marketing Officer at Analytics. Welcome to the show, Katie. Thank you very much, Lou. Now, our audience loves to hear people's origin stories. And I usually ask my guests in the beginning to take us through a journey through tech and what actually brought you to Analytics. Okay. Well, I started off uh, as a an engineer from the University of Michigan. I took my engineering degree and went straight to law school and became a patent attorney and litigator. Um, a lot of my career was spent out in Silicon Valley until I moved up to Redmond when Microsoft asked me to come in house to manage patent litigation. And Lou, as a, a Microsoft yourself, you can appreciate that we were very busy as a deep pocket target defendant at the time. And I just ran around the country going courtroom to courtroom. So when I decided to settle down and have a family, I moved back to my hometown of Traverse City, Michigan. And around that time, I started working with Casey Cowell, who had founded US Robotics. Casey was on an initiative to create a tech community in Northern Michigan in Traverse City. And that was really how I came to become CEO of a big data company, a startup. Uh, at the time, I was recognized in the big data 100 as the only woman, uh, known woman CEO in all of big data. And we had a cloud native uh, platform. It was uh, master data management, data quality, all focused on data accuracy. And as is the dream of many startups, you seek exit by uh, acquisition by a strategic investor. We fortunately were able to do that. And th that strategic investor is Analytics. When I was joining the analytics team, I said, hey, what do you guys need? Um, you know, and in terms of, you know, executive help here. And they said, we need a chief marketing officer. So, you know, my first thought was, well, gosh, I'm probably the most likely candidate being an engineer lawyer. <laughs> but the one common thread 
throughout my career has really been taking complex technology and translating it to make it understandable for a business user or a judge or a jury. And I really enjoy um, that piece of what I continue to do uh, with analytics. That's great. I think I think that's I think that's a good position for a lot of organizations today because a lot of organizations they don't know what they're doing. <laughs> they need they need somebody to translate solutions uh, or or data into solutions. And I think that's a, a a good segue into you know just data in general. I think that a lot of organizations have a lot of data. They have a fire hose of data. They have lots of data that they're storing, whether it's in you know on premise or in the cloud. They don't know necessarily how to make use of it for their customers. What are you seeing organizations doing here? Like right now, what what are some of the solutions that organizations are doing to or, or taking on to help make sense of all these different disparate versions of their data? I think, um, you know, we, we've seen, of course, data silos being created by decentralized IT purchasing uh, with these best of breed applications. And so right now, I think a lot of companies have their data um, fragmented. It's across multiple different cloud applications. Sometimes it's even on premises. And most often, um, folks are set out to try to answer business questions and their data is not even in the right form or format to be able to answer the question posed. Let's layer into that now mid-market. And that is one of the focuses of analytics is bringing these technologies to mid-market companies that typically either couldn't afford them or, or couldn't use them. And if you think of, you know, your typical mid-market IT uh, director, this person is now asked to become an IT superhero. And in addition to keeping their systems, their networks, their their workstations safe, secure, stable, running uptime, and maybe even running the help desk. In addition to that, now in order to be competitive in uh, particular industries, they're being asked to create databases, build cloud architectures, understand how to manage data, how to integrate data, Oh, and on top of that, why don't you build us a data analytics solution? So I think that there are a lot of lofty goals with board of directors and with um, executives and that poor IT superhero, it's not not even humanly possible to be able to to make use of all of the technologies that are available. So with fragmented data and trying to get it to be answers for real business problems so you can achieve business outcomes, um, there's a huge gap with the mid-market being able to do that. Right. So let, let's take a. I will take the scenario here because I'm, I'm actually interested to see like what an organization would do here. Like, let's say I'm a um, I'm a retailer that has lots of data. I use some kind of old technologies. My data is siloed. Um, different aspects of my business have data silos, um, and I come to um, a place like Analytics and I say, "Listen, like I I need to make sense. I need to start building some KPIs for my C-suite and my and 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 my organization, my sales organization, and so on, and and help really." understand if my customers are happy, where my growth is, where my, where my, where things are going down. What, what do I do? Like, how do I start? Where do I start to start bringing this data together? Well, with us, our approach is a side-by-side model where we're not just selling somebody a tool or a technology and measuring success by implementation milestones and leaving them to try to figure out how to make use of it and how to, how to get business value out of it. Um, we start with the business question and that's got to lead, you know, okay, is it that I want to have a propensity model for which uh, product is the best product to offer each customer of one every day? Okay, that's your, that's the business outcome you're trying to achieve. So then we back that up and we will start to build the solution um, using our, we have a private cloud and data management uh, that, you know, I mentioned before. And then we have a team of data scientists in an innovation lab who are building uh, AI and, and algorithms um, that are industry specific and set to have the proper weighting and consider the proper data points that are salient for a business question in a particular industry, um, such as banking. We do a lot with credit unions and, and community banks. And so when you think about the needs um, of that industry, it's very different for manufacturing. And we really partner side by side with our business analysts um, in-house in in these different industries so that we're asking and finding answers to industry specific questions with our data analytics. 
So I think one of the interesting parts here is as, as you kind of work with these organizations, okay, we have these different silos. We're going to help you bring them together. We're going to have you br- help bring them in our cloud. And you said a little bit how you work with financial institutions. Now, you know, I have question, many questions are going around in my head around, well, you're bringing data out of their kind of safe zone, their compliant zone, you're bringing it into a cloud. So I, I assume that your cloud is, is compliant in many different ways. Is that correct? Most definitely. We even have FedRAMP compliance, so we can have okay. Department of Defense data. Yeah. Fantastic. So I think so the, the organization brings their data into your cloud and then you start working with them to help develop some insights. Are you, are you helping them to build uh, complete campaigns around this? So like, for instance, if they're trying to answer specific business questions and so you you help them kind of build out their structured data and make sense out of it all, like what, what's the next step for that organization once the data is there? Do you, do you run models on it? What's, what's, the, what's the process? Yep, so we are integrating data um, into our cloud, but we also can work in multi-cloud and hybrid environments. And from there, our um, data management platform is uh, creating golden records of information using data cleansing, data integration, and the rest of it. And then it goes through uh, different transformations so that it is um, ready for analytics. We build data marts that are industry specific. So we might have relational databases, one about um, banking members for a credit union, another about accounts and different things. Um, So our data science team structures it. And then from there, uh, the questions to be answered we build custom algorithms uh, to be optimized for whatever type of of inquiry we're using uh, for the customer. And it could be customer intelligence. Um, That's a a big use case um, for for our company, but also operational efficiencies. um, Things like for a bank, knowing where to open a branch or close a branch. Uh, Traditionally in banking, they get credit for wherever a customer opened an account but over time people often move or maybe they were banking near their business and during covid you know now they're banking out near where they live and so rather than just giving credit to the location where they open their account which is the traditional way banks look at their business or actually looking at things like okay well where are people really banking and giving um you know the the credit unions and and community banks that type of information so that they can uh, strengthen their operations as well so that's actually an interesting use case. I think that um, you, you're you're kind of helping build out. So, so you do you have domain experts in these areas? So you have people who are like experts in the like the like the financial in, uh, side of the market. You have experts. So you're having people who are kind of understand that type of data and what insights uh, organizations need when you're building these things out. Exactly. We have industry specific business analysts. So we have a financial services team. We have a healthcare team uh, where we're working on revenue cycle analytics for healthcare providers. We have a team that works on uh, manufacturing. Um, a great use case there for analytics was um, an, an RV maker, uh, automaker who wanted to um, get better detail on sales performance. And they weren't sure is, you know, sales. Um, are the sales numbers tracking with inventory or things maybe down in one location based upon uh, supply chain issues? And so we were able to get in and combine data from the client as well as third party sources for enrichment to be able to compare inventory levels with channel partners and lot locations, even taking it down to um, that level of analysis for them to be able to optimize. So it's interesting because I, you know, I've worked in the ERP region of software for a while, um, and you know, a lot of organizations, even though they're using single ser- uh, single systems for this, where they're gaining data from their financials or their sales or their inventory, it, you know, and they're storing it in one place, it's still really challenging for them to build this out. IT organizations, like you said, are not able to do that because they don't necessarily o- uh, understand the different aspects of business. Um, and so, so you're saying that you know, you provide these these specialties, these uh, these uh, these analysts that actually help with this. Now, where do, where does these other uh, parts come into play? Now, we talked a little bit about insights as a service and using this data where you're you're developing and you're starting to use more advanced technologies like machine learning and AI around the data. So now that you've been able to to kind of cleanse the data and make more sense out of that data, um, are you are you are they helping to also build these models the and and and, and develop those analytics uh, for later use or what, what's the process there? 
Oh yes. Um, so our we have I, I think I mentioned side by side model, and it doesn't yep. mean that we're like running out data scientists to people. It's it's not a consulting type of operation at all. It's a SaaS company uh, with our data platform, but along with our technology and tools, we have um, access to our data engineers, to our data scientists, to our cloud engineers, architects, and that kind of thing. So we start with often a client won't necessarily know which technology to use. You know, if you look at, I'm sure you you see tons of technologies every day <laughs> and and a lot of your your podcast and, and and things you know you're always talking to different folks and there are a lot of technology companies out there and i think that a big challenge for um, a mid-market company who's not in the tech industry is if you look at this landscape of thousands of different um, options in each category well where do you even start to put together the solution right and so that's really where we come in and we can answer those questions we will seamlessly change things in and out for example with security if we think that um, one security you know, technique and, and tool is is better than another one or something has changed. And so our clients don't have to worry about that. Um, but with our industry specific knowledge, that's really where the data analytics comes into play. I think that with the cloud uh, that we offer, our cybersecurity we offer um, and uh, security operations centers, as well as with the data management, that's kind of more of a horizontal um, type of approach, you know, in, in play, because that's not really industry specific necessarily. But when you hit data analytics, that's really where the business analysts come into play and help and work with our clients to um, understand, okay, what is the business challenge? And then our business analysts who are skilled in that industry understand which data points are pertinent and salient for answering the questions that are being posed for analytics. Fantastic. Well, folks, we have a lot more to talk about here. And I do want to bring my co-host back in. But before we do, we do have to thank another great sponsor of this week in enterprise tech. And that's Bitwarden. Now, we talk a lot about cyber threats and how they're exploiting passwords. In fact, we just talked about it today, a vulnerability in your organization's workflow in one of our bytes. Now, one way to increase your security posture is to use a password manager. Now, Bitwarden is the only open source cross-platform password manager that can be used at home, at work, or on the go, and is trusted by millions. Now, with Bitwarden, you can securely store credentials across personal and business worlds. Every Bitwarden account begins with the creation of of a personal vault. Now use Bitwarden for your business. It's fully customizable, just features using enterprise policies. Use Bitwarden Send, a fully encrypted method to transmit sensitive information, whether it's text or files. Team members can generate unique secure passwords for every site. You'll get enterprise grade security and they are GDPR, CCPA, HIPAA, and SOC 2 compliant. Their end to end encrypted vault helps mitigate phishing attacks by storing passwords and much, much more. Now, Bitwarden recently announced that they have taken the first steps on two major initiatives. First, the icons within the app have been updated, heralding a coming update to their user interface. Second, the ability to switch accounts has been added to the desktop application to easily switch between multiple Bitwarden accounts, such as your personal and work accounts using a drop down list without having to log out and log back in. Now, this provides convenient access to vault items from either account and allows you to maintain separation of personal and work vault items. Account switching will be rolled out to other platforms very, very soon. They're interested in business plan? Well, their team's organization option is $3 a month per user where you can share private data securely with your coworkers, department, or entire organization. Now, for enterprises, you use Bitwarden's enterprise organization plan for just $5 a month per user. Now, Bitwarden believes that everyone should have access to basic password security tools. So individuals can use their basic free account forever for an unlimited number of passwords or upgrade anytime to their premium account for less than a dollar a month. Now, if you're looking for secure password storage for your entire family, well, their family organization option gives you up to six users premium features for only $3.33 a month. Using the Bitwarden Cloud, you can get started in no time. Monitor and manage security vulnerabilities using their Bitwarden Vault health reports. Identify exposed, reused, weak, or potentially compromised passwords, as well as any items in your vault with inactive 2FA. There has been a recent news about popular password manager suffering a credential stuffing attack. Credential stuffing is known and unfortunately common attack 
whereby hackers attempt to use usernames and passwords that they find on the dark web to log into other websites. Now, this serves as a reminder that it's always important to use different passwords for every website you visit. And when you're using Password Manager to create a strong, unique password only for your password manager, not used anywhere else. At Twit, we are fans of password managers. Bitworn is the only open source cross-platform password manager that can be used at home, on the go, or at work, and is trusted by millions of individuals, teams, and organizations worldwide. Get started with a free trial of a Teams or Enterprise plan, or get started for free across all devices as an individual user at bitwarden.com slash twit. That's bitwarden.com slash twit. And we thank Bitwarden for their support of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Well, folks, we've been talking with Katie Horvath. She's Chief Marketing Officer at Analytics about data management and data analytics. And I do want to bring my co-host back in because they're chomping at the bit here. They want to get some questions as, as well. I think I will throw it to um, Chibert first. Chibert? Hey, man. So analytics sounds like it got a lot of great resources and things like that, but I have this niggling feeling in the back of my mind. If I'm a small to medium sized corporation, is that even appropriate for your services? Yes. I mean, I think the mid market really has been left behind. If you look at, for example, master data management solutions, they're priced for the enterprise and they require you to hire highly skilled FTEs traditionally to be able to use and to maintain the systems. So really, um, if these companies in the mid market want to stay competitive and not just survive, but start to, you know, to be able to thrive and pair personalized white glove service that they might be known for with data and analytics to have data driven decisions, then most definitely these technologies are appropriate. Oh, it sounds great. You know, I almost went to work for um, Deloitte back in the days and uh, I got I was being recruited because of my physics background, you know, what kinds of subject matter silos do you have available um, to tap? Well, we have cybersecurity specialists, we have cloud engineers, architects, um, you know, folks who are versed in, in building databases and, and data pipelines, um, integration, you know, using anything from, I'll, you know, throw out the buzzwords of Kubernetes and containers and <laughs> all of that kind of stuff. But at the same time, we also do have data scientists, um, a huge team of them, and we have business analysts as well. And we provide managed IT services for people who want that whole end-to-end -end solution. Um, one thing that ties into the early part of the program before I um, was brought on is security. And we had made a decision as a company um, that we were no longer gonna do any managed IT services without security embedded into it, just because it's that important. And so um, that's another area where we have a lot of specialty. Cool. Hey, so. If one of our viewers wants to learn a bit more, how do they get started with you folks? You know, do they need to do like an inventory or have some sort of plan? What's the type of homework they need to consider before they call you folks up? Really, it's, you know, what is your business challenge you're trying to solve? Um, if you know you need your data to come together in some way, you don't need to know how, you don't need to know what type of technologies and tools you wanna to put together and piece together for a solution, we'll help you with that. Um, really, it's just understanding um, what your business challenge is, and then we'll sit down and, and talk to you about how we can work together to come up with a solution. Fantastic. Thank you, Chibert. I'm going to bring Curtis back in as well. Curtis? Thanks, Lou. I appreciate it. You know, when I'm hearing you talk about this, it seems like you, you do try, fall into a number of different buckets that a company might want to to choose. Now, I know that in the security world where I spend my time, a lot of companies have dealt with a lack of um, security talent, uh, or at least affordable security talent, by shifting to managed security service providers, MSSPs. Is that analogous to the kind of relationship that you're finding that you have with with your customers on the analytics side or is is it more complex than that 
Um, it is analogous to that. Uh, so with our security team, for example, yes, we will do um, outsourced security operations center for companies, uh, for you know companies, especially in highly regulated industries. And we become their partner. On the data side, we can partner to become basically the chief data officer to help with um, you know coming up with strategies to achieve what their end business goals are and then layer in um, our data analytics. And so we're using our, our tools and technologies that we build, but we're also bringing to that the expertise of the people skills needed to enable them and, and to get value out of them. I think that this was a huge challenge in the mid-market even before we hit the talent war of 2022. Um, so, you know, finding that that unicorn data scientist was really going to be tough for a mid-market company sitting in Kansas, for example, and now it's near impossible as we see that even the tech giants are having trouble finding enough resources to keep up with the demand. We also know that with COVID, right, I mean, that really accelerated cloud adoption big time. Everybody's now working from home. We've got zero trust principles. We have to look at um, security from user and access basis and not, you know, sitting within the confines of your firewall at your facility. And so with that cloud adoption, that has really changed the landscape for data as well, not only for access and security, but also for data management and for then analytics. And so I think that one of the big challenges that we're going to see coming up in the future is that a lot of people are now relying on on different cloud native applications for lines of business. And what happens if all of a sudden that app vendor goes away? Where's your data? Um, and you know, granted, they're probably gonna have a contract with third party pu public or private cloud vendor, but if you're not in control of that and you don't have your data as part of an end-to-end -end solution where the, the application came with cloud, then you're you know, maybe forced with a shutdown or a stay of operations that you can't afford while you're trying to get your hands back on your data. So that's something I forecast that will probably happen in the future. And um, we're that's one of the things that we're working toward with our end-to-end -end solution to be able to be that answer for a lot of different buckets for mid-market customers that really need all of these types of services and aren't just looking for one tool. You know, that's an interesting point that you make. And the scenario that you pointed out is certainly something that we've seen on the consumer side in mm -hmm. a number of instances, whether it be uh, photo management or music or other kinds of personal data. But fortunately, we haven't seen it in a large way on the enterprise side. Uh, but you bring up a really good point in that most organizations have multiple relationships with multiple cloud-based uh, applications, each of which is going to come with their own cloud data storage, sometimes native to the application, sometimes not. Um, is a company like yours able to rationalize that across the various applications and, and data sources and, and do so in a way that is less human intensive for the customer than it would be if they tried to say, well, we're just going to do everything based on our AWS account or our Azure account, you know, something like that, where they were simply going with uh, one or another of the basically bare metal enterprise cloud services. I think, um, you know, really the challenge today is going to be that everybody needs to be prepared for multi-cloud and hybrid environments. You know, we have data sitting in, I'll call them the, the data basements of old insurance companies that have, a, you know, vast volumes of data. And if only they can turn it into an asset, man, oh man, are they going to be rich because of the volume of data that they have to protect, potentially, you know, get in, insights from. Um, but the truth is people are gonna have their data in multiple locations. And so here stems the need, the strong need, the ever increasing need for data integration. Um, and if people are interested in SaaS data backup uh, type of a situation, that's something that we do too with our cloud. Um, not necessarily, you know, keeping it up uh, a copy for disaster recovery purposes, but more so that you'll have your hands on um, your data if you need it. 
Very good. Well, this is the the set of questions that I have, and I've got some some security issues. As I said, that's where I live. But uh, I think I would very much like uh, my colleague Brian to to come in. He has a way of phrasing those questions that uh, brings a lot of value to our listeners. Brian, you want to take it from here? Actually, I I'm just pulling out my my standard crystal ball question i'd like you to step back a little bit shine up your crystal ball and one of the topics that keeps coming up in episode after episode after episode is are we ever going to get to a password less world and since security is definitely one of your in your wheelhouse how about you pontificate a little bit on what do we need to do to actually get to a passwordless world and you know, should I even buy some stock in something? <laughs> <laughs> hey, be careful. Be careful. You know, often with these newer investment options in crypto, that's actually opening the door for cybersecurity mm. risk because of uh, the different offers you get. And, and anyhow, um, crystal ball. OK, I, I like to think about Orwell in 1984. Love that novel. Mm -hmm. I like to think about the movie, The Minority Report, where, you know, as Tom Cruise is going down the moving sidewalk based on his eyes uh, and he'll see different ads from the person next to him because everything's so hyper personalized. And in that sense, perhaps we'll go to more biometrics uh, instead of password protection. I don't know if that's going to encourage people to take other people's eyeballs out or take their fingers off <laughs> or all the things that we see in the movies. But um, yeah, I, I don't know, you know, exactly how we're going to get there, but I do think that it's probably going to involve some sort of biotechnology. At the same time, though, if we go back to Orwell's 1984, you know, we spent years trying to fight Big Brother, and now we're signing up for it. All right. Thank you, Katie. Well, unfortunately, all good things must come to end. Thank you so much for being here. I did want before we closed up. I did want to give you a chance to maybe tell, tell the folks at home where they can learn more about analytics, what it has to offer, maybe inquire about getting started. Yeah, um, our website um, it's analytics.com. It's right here, showing up um, right under me. And uh, happy to have conversations with anybody. Um, you know, our different um, products span a lot of things that are, can provide an end-to-end -end solution. We are industry specific. Do a lot with uh, banking, financial institutions, as well as healthcare, manufacturing, and governments. Uh, so happy to talk to you, and maybe I'll see you on the road at one of the trade shows as well so much well folks you've done it again you just have to do another hour of the best dang enterprise podcast in the universe so definitely tune your podcatcher to twyatt i want to thank everyone who makes this show possible especially to my co-host our their very own mr brian chi chibert what's going on for you in the coming weeks and where can people find you i have finally got caught up on documentation to send off to my cpa for my taxes good lord my my long suffering wife and I were sorting through all kinds of receipts and then scanning them because we have to send it back to Honolulu because I still have to file Hawaii state tax darn. But anyway, other than my dealing with the tax man, um, I'm doing all kinds of tinkering and I would love to talk to people about it. I'm actually getting ready to go and build an electric uh, tricycle for an LD friend. And I talk about a lot of this on Twitter. And my Twitter handle is A-D-V-N-E-T-L-A-B, Advanced Net Lab. And would love to hear from you. Um, folks have been throwing me all kinds of ideas for guests who we should try and get onto the interview pipeline. And, you know, if you don't want to throw it onto something as public as Twitter, you're welcome to throw it on email. My email is Chebert spelled C-H-E-E-B-E-R-T at twit.tv. And if you want to hit all the hosts, you're welcome to use twiet at twit.tv. Would love to hear from you and um, keep those ideas coming. Thank you, Chibrit. Well, we also have to thank our very own Mr. Curtis Franklin. Curtis, what's going on for you in the coming week and what could people find you and all of your work? Well, people can always find me at Dark Reading as well as on Twitter. I'm KG4GWA and on Instagram, Kurt underscore Franklin. 
You know, I'm doing all kinds of entertaining things around uh, cybersecurity. Uh, it's where I live. Uh, just did something um, for our Omnia subscribers. Uh, and I'm going to be having a new article on dark reading next week, uh, looking at a threat that came to us via a Super Bowl commercial. So uh, be on the lookout for that. In the meantime, if there's anything you want to know about the world of cybersecurity, please drop me a note on either uh, Twitter or Instagram. We'd love to hear from you. Always happy to hear from the Twyatt Riot. Thank you, Curtis. Thank you guys for being here. Well, we also have to thank you as well. You're the person who drops in each and every week to listen to our show and get your enterprise and IT goodness. We want to make it easy for you to watch and listen to catch up on your enterprise and IT news. So go to our show page right now, twit.tv slash twiet. There you'll find all the amazing back episodes, the show notes, the co-host information, the guest information, and of course, links to the stories that we do during the show. But more importantly, next to those videos, you'll get those helpful subscribe and download links. Support the show by getting your audio version, your video version of your choice and listen on any one of your devices or any one of your podcast applications because we're on all of them. So subscribe and definitely support the show. Plus, you may have heard, that's right, we have Club Twit as well. It's a member-only ad-free podcast service with a bonus Twit Plus feed that you can't get anywhere else and it's only $7 a month. And it comes with a great exclusive access to members-only Discord channel as well. Some really fun and interesting conversations in there, some great channels, some great content. Of course, they're masters of the GIF in there. Animated GIF, definitely check that out. It's a really amazing community. Become part of Twit Club Twit. Join it at twit.tv slash Club Twit. Now, Club Twit now offers corporate group plans as well. It's a great way to give your team access to our ad free tech podcast. The plans start with five members at a discounted rate of $6 each per month, and you can as many seats as you like. Now, this is a great way for your IT department, your developers, your tech teams, your sales team to stay up to date with access to all of our podcasts. And just like the regular membership, you also get access to that Twist Discord channel as well as the Twit Plus bonus feed as well. That's twit.tv slash club twit plus it's that time of the year the twit audience survey is here that annual survey helps us understand our audience so we can make it a better listening experience for you even better now it'll only take a couple minutes so go to twit.tv slash survey 22 to take it. it only takes a couple minutes so definitely check it out and give us some information and actually after your after you've subscribed, you can impress your friends, your family members, your coworkers with the gift of Twyla because we talk about a lot of fun tech topics here on the show. And we definitely want you to share it with them because they'll find find it fun and interesting as well. Now, after you've subscribed, if you're available on Fridays at 1:30 p.m. Pacific time, we do this show live. That's right. you can see all the mishaps and the mistakes that we made. Come see all the how the pizzas made. Come see all the banter behind the scenes. So check that out at live.twit.tv. Now, if you're going to watch the show live, you might as well jump into our IRC chat room as well. It's the live chat room. That's at irc.twit.tv. There we have some amazing characters and some great conversations. They always give us some great ideas in there. So we really appreciate them to be being here each and every week. So definitely join that if you're going to watch the show live. Now definitely hit me up as well at twitter.com slash lumm. There I post, post all of some pretty good, amazing enterprise tidbits each and every week. Plus, I like to have conversations with people like you about show ideas. Plus, if you want to, if you're actually interested about what I do at my normal work week at Microsoft, you can check that out as well. Go to developers.microsoft.com slash office. There we post the latest and greatest ways for you to customize your office experience to make it more productive for you. You can use JavaScript, you can use TypeScript, you can you can customize Outlook, PowerPoint, Excel, Word, whichever one you want, and really make it a full customized experience for you and your organization. So definitely check it out and see what you can do. Now, I want to make sure I thank everyone who makes this show possible, especially to Leo and Lisa. They continue to support this week, this week in Enterprise Tech each and every week, and we couldn't do this show without them. So thank you for all their support. And of course, thank you to all the engineers and staff at Twit as well. And I also want to thank Mr. Brian Chi one more time. He's not only our co-host, but he's also our tireless producer as well. He does all the show bookings and the plannings for the show, and we really couldn't do this show without him. So thank you, Chibert, for all your support over the years and doing that. And before we sign out, we have to thank our editor, 
Mr. Anthony. He makes us look good after the fact. He cuts out all the all the mishaps and all the blips. So thank you, Anthony, for all your support. Plus, our technical director to, to, for today, he's the talented Mr. Ant Pruitt, and he does a fabulous show here on Twit called Hands On Photography, which I watch each and every week religiously. And what's going on for you on uh, Hands On Photography this week? Well, Mr. Lou, I'm sure you've heard of a little app known as Instagram, right? <laughs> well, they have yet another competitor trying to hop onto the scene, and I take a look at this so-called competitor. It's called Pigeon. Yeah, Pigeon. That's an interesting name for a Instagram competitor. Very Thought. interesting. <laughs> I'm just going to leave it at that. So go check out the show, twit.tv slash hop. It's twit.tv slash H-O-P. Thank you, Ant. And until next time, I'm Louis Moresca, just reminding you, if you want to know what's going on in the enterprise, just keep quiet. Don't miss All About Android every week. We talk about the latest news, hardware, apps, and now all the developer goodness happening in the Android ecosystem. I'm Jason Howell, also joined by Ron Richards, Florence Ion, and our newest co-host on the panel, Wen Tu Dao, who brings her developer chops really great stuff. We also invite people from all over the Android ecosystem to talk about this mobile platform we love so much. Join us every Tuesday, all about Android on twit.tv.